Hello everybody and welcome back to Language Litigation and Integration Part 3. Uh, this one is called Illiteracy, the Root of All Evil. Um, and this episode what we're going to do is we're going to explore, again, how language developed. We're going to demonstrate, uh, in my previous lecture I said sound is the basis of language. We're going to go through and that context defines a variable. We're going to demonstrate that with different languages and the same languages with different contexts. Um, but we're going to, the overall theme of this lecture will just be to explore how literacy affects individual behavior and the behavior of a society. Um, and what we're going to do, in addition to the languages, we're going to do a couple physics demonstrations. We're going to review a couple articles. Again, on my last lecture, we looked at Reddit a little bit. We might look at Reddit again, but we'll look at actual scientific publications and popular science articles about scientific publications. <laughs> and then I'm going to propose a breakthrough scientific model called the Spook and Goof Model of the Universe. And that is going to be kind of a joke, uh, unfortunately probably not a joke, but just kind of a mockery of, a, of an illiterate society. Um, hence spooks and goofs. But to start, let's ask ourselves a question. What makes a person literate? Um, if you ask anyone on the street, they'd probably respond that the ability to read and write makes you literate. And I would say yes, but I want to modify that definition and say it is the act of actively reading and writing. Um, and what I mean by actively, I wrote not the ability to, um, but what I mean by actively reading and writing is reading to expand your, your, your technical knowledge base. Um, literature is good, it's, it's good leisure writing and, and reading, but I'm talking reading subjects that you are not trained in, um, or maybe that you are trained in, but you want to get a better knowledge base, um, but also reading with an open mind to learn something new or to improve upon something, not simply to hear your own thoughts said back to you. Um, and that's, that's really where I want to start because again, most people, I, I don't say, I, I would say most people, I don't know, there's definitely facts out there, but most people can read and write, but where I think our society fails big time is people don't actively do so. So now let's move on and we'll start with the languages. So previously, in one of my last lectures on the last little clip, I said again that sound is the basis of language, but also that uh, all language is foreign, or that there is no a grammar, it's just the uh, alphabet you set up. So I have up here written, all my language foreign. I like my language like I like my cars. <laughs> um, <laughs> but what I'm going to show you is just different alphabets that people around the world use to represent different sounds. Uh, the first thing I want to say is, um, the first, like I said on my previous lecture, I showed you that the Sumerians, or told you that the Sumerians was the first written civilization on historical record. Um, a very important thing to point out is, again, I've said that the, the letters and the words that are left over are the actual evidence. Nobody actually knows, I, I don't know this for certain, but I'm fairly positive no one actually knows how to read Sumerian. Um, again, we just see their alphabets. Um, but what I want to point out there is, is that is direct evidence of human civilization that we don't even know what they were saying, literally with their alphabet, but clearly, right, when you have a child, you teach them all of the important things. Um, going all the way back in human history, even if you lose a civilization, the words that are remain store the value of what is important to pass on to the next generation. So even without being able to read uh, Sumerian, we know that we haven't really missed out on anything important because, well, our species has survived. Um, it's pretty simple, but it is the actual proof. Um, so now getting back to the languages and again to how context defines a variable. This is, if you're an English speaker or French, Spanish, or Portuguese, or a lot of other places in the world too, um, you're using the Roman alphabet. Literally, first of all, alphabet is a Greek word. It's literally the first two letters of 
the Greek alphabet, but letters represent sounds. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. Now, I'm probably going to mess this up um, and try to go through a couple alphabets, but my point is, is I want you to notice any time you use the same symbol or any time you say the same sound. Um, but we're going to give this a shot. So now if I was in France, I would say A, B, C, D, E, F, J, H, E, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. So there, there's just two different sets of sounds, both represented by the same alphabet. Now if we pop over to Greece, modern Greece, we have alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, eta, theta, iota, kappa, lambda, mi, ni, xi, omicron, pi, rho, sigma, taf, ypsilon, phi, chi, C, excuse me, I'm trying not to raise my voice, but clearly I'm not very familiar with this alphabet. Psi, people would call that psi in English, but it's psi. Then gamma, or omega, not gamma. Now, if we pop over here to the Cyrillic alphabet, we have a, v, b, g, d, y, y, j, z, e, I Krakaya, Kappa, L, M, N, O, P, R, C, T, Y, Yo, I don't, I don't know what that one is. F, He, C, Sha, Cher, Sha, Sho, something like that. For those three, I don't know. Um, Tivyordijnak, U, Miyakiznak, E, U, Ya. And so, now what I'm going to do is go through and show you some of the same sounds. Right? J, or J. If you said J in Russian, it's literally the same exact, in a sentence, it's the same exact sound as J in French. If you say C in Russian, this is the same exact sound as C in Polish. C. And now, still looking at the Russian alphabet, if we had L, M, N, O. Alright, this little P looking thing with a backwards little tail. L. L. That's the same as if you said L in French. E, E, L, L, E. Um, what are some other ones? Oh yeah, those are the those are the alphabets. Um, and now we'll show you some words of the same of the same language. So now I just wanted to show you a quick example again of context and accents, kind of in real real time. And up on the board, I just have como esta, como estoy. How are you? As I am. Um, and what I want to show you, because Spanish is probably the most prominent, where every time you're asking a question, right, como, if you're talking to someone in, real, in, in, in person, the context is very clear if you're asking a question or if you're using like or as. Um, but again, it's the same word. Um, and equivalently, esta, right? you have eso, esa, for that, para, that, and esta, and esto, for this, para, this. But again, if you're writing, the accent is not obvious, so you put an accent mark to 
indicate the context. Um, and that's really all I wanted to show there. Moving on. So now I want to talk about and demonstrate what I call lost in translation. Again, we have our Sumerians. We don't know how to read their alphabet. But we speak words, and those words were clearly derived way a long, long time ago. Um, but to demonstrate, well, I'd say it's very common amongst multilingual people. So once you're confident in another language, you actually can't stand other people's translations. Um, so I want to show you that. And in my previous lecture, uh, The Plague of Word Salad, I'm going to show you literally how people introduce words that other people do not say and it stays in diction through translation. So what up here, I just have a quote from Descartes, 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 1637. Um, it says, Pour moi, je n'ai jamais présumé que mon esprit fut en rien plus parfait que ce du commun, commun, commun. I don't know how to say that word. And this is just, again, Descartes was very popular. Um, très populaire, maybe. Um, but now here is the translation. This is what is written in this book. This is just a, a French reader book, but Descartes is anywhere. It says, As for me, I have never presumed that my mind was in any way more perfect than those commonly found. I want you to emphasize on found, the word found. I'll just write it up here. That is not what this sentence says. First off, it says, the translation says, as for me, pour moi, for me. Comme pour moi would be as for me. I have never presumed that mon esprit says mind, but this literally translates to spirit. But French people say spirit and mind is the same thing because it is. Foot. That's, that's got to be an older... Uh, literary French uses other conjugation that spoken French it doesn't really use anymore. But this is basically was in for me. I have never presumed that my spirit was in. Well, it doesn't. We haven't even said never yet. Was in never more perfect than those of common. That's what this sentence says. For me, I have never presumed that my spirit was in, we still haven't said never yet, was in never more perfect than those of common. The word found is not in this sentence at all. This is a translator. Somebody else came along, read the sentence, and says this is what it means. And that, 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 that doesn't happen. Um, and this is very important historically. Right? If you go read the Bible, and you're talking about the Tower of Babel, this is literally what they're talking about. And again, it's not, it's not that... You might say, who cares? I mean, you still kind of get the meaning of the sentence. Um, I guess your unless you're a language scholar, it really doesn't matter. Um, but I just wanted to show you, this is how other people put diction into... Uh, well, I guess it, it does matter. We're, we're going to talk about gossiping, actually. But this is how people put other words into sentences that other people literally did not say. Um, now, moving on. So now what we're going to do is we're going to make all of these things I'm saying... Well, in the beginning I said we're going to do some physical demonstrations. We're going to do that, and we're going to make this all a very extremely literal argument. Right? I am vibrating my vocal cords right now to transmit information to you. But I, what, up, I, what I have up here is you can't say what you don't know. Right? If you're a native English speaker and there's some fact out in the world you don't know, you can't talk meaningfully about it. But before that, right, no one really remembers learning language, but if you can't physically vibrate your vocal cords to make the sounds, when we were going through the alphabets, I mean, I've been practicing these foreign languages, like, diligently um, for several years now. So, 
a lot of people, you probably, frankly, a lot of native English speakers learning um, uh, Slavic languages, um, or even other romantic languages, the first, you'll, you'll feel the tendons and the ligaments in the front of your neck stress out a lot more while you're learning the languages. Um, but to do that, I just have my guitar, shameless plug. I make a lot of music, you should definitely check it out, also on my YouTube channel. But just playing a simple chord, right? If I were to sit here and mute all the strings, you can form a rhythm, but you can't really form a key. There's no tone. But you can still dance to this. Now if I were to, right, demonstrating tension, all of these strings have been tuned in the same way your chords, your vocal cords are literally tied to your diaphragm from your neck. And I have way better music, but I just, I, my point to show you is, in the same way this thing vibrates to make sounds, we vibrate in the same physical way to make sounds. And if you haven't practiced the guitar, if you haven't practiced your languages, you literally can't make the sounds to say the words that already exist out there in experience, right? I, in my last lecture, I had two, or I just had the experience of an individual and then the circle of experience way bigger than that. If there's things that are articulate, properly articulated in other languages and you don't learn them, you literally can't say what other people have said. But we also, like I said, it doesn't... The semantic meanings don't get lost because experience is uniform regardless of the sound you are making to represent those experiences. But I just wanted to show you, I mean it's a very, it's a, very, it's a literal physical limitation. Um, but now up here I just have three different triangles and I have generality to specificity. Again, jumping back to physics, temperature cools down, you can have different Molecules, you can have different atoms, then different molecules, then people, different life forms, blah, blah, blah. Now we have humanity, we're out here with a bunch of different life forms, different species, and humanity, if, you, if you're a baby, you can't really say anything, you can't say anything. If you're a child, you don't say anything too interesting. The more words you learn, the more experiences you have, the more bona fide as an individual you become. Right? Think about how you learn. Anyone goes on YouTube right now today and learns from other individuals that are like them. And that was where our likeness bias came in. And now, getting to the human species, um, I up here, the last triangle is primitivity to morality. Um, and that should be very, again, biologically true. How, if we turn on the National Geographic channel right now today, and we watch that antelope about to get mauled by the lion, we put a G rating on that. If we have a TV show on our, uh, our a reality TV show watching it, describing a murder, that is a different moral assessment by our own species, by our own ratings. Um, but my point to you is, is this is what people remember. People remember individuality, and past individuality, right, we have people like Hitler, but you remember people that are extremely moral as better people than people who have done bad things like Hitler, like Jesus, or Gandhi, or God, or Confucius, or Martin Luther King, or blah, blah, blah. But what I wanted to, like I said, I just wanted to show you that the it seems silly to say but you literally have vocal cords in your body and if you don't physically train them you can't make sounds and if you can't make the sounds you can't talk about what other people have talked about um now now we're going to do the spook and goof model of the universe we're going to talk about how uh gossip translates um how that affects people. I mean, that should be a very uh, engageable thing. Everyone's been bullied or been treated like shit to some extent um, by somebody. Um, so yeah, now we'll talk about those things. So now that we've talked about how individuals learn language, we've demonstrated physically literally why you can speak, now I'm going to introduce my most profound scientific discovery of all time, 
and it's called the spook and goof model of the universe. And what I'm going to propose here is that we, the United States of America, 2020, is an illiterate society. Should be funny, but it really isn't. Um, so just up here I've written, the more illiterate you are, the more primitive you are. That is overwhelmingly true. Go talk to any violent offender in any criminal, or any, any jail, or any prison. Or go read on Reddit. I don't have the post here, but within the past week, um, there was a very popular Ask Reddit about um, just people who have been to jail and who was the scariest person in jail. And one thing that all murderers, rapists, assaulters have in common is they are all illiterate. Um, and that's, that's so demonstrably true over all of human history. So now we have three characters up here, and we're going to explore how these people would behave in different scenarios, and then we're going to contrast that with our own society and see which kind of society we have. So the three people we have up here is Reasonable Randy. Um, Reasonable Randy reads a lot of books. He's really educated, goes out into the world, takes time to educate himself. He has normal goals and expectations. He doesn't think going to college is going to get him a good job. He doesn't think to start a business you need to quit your job. He just says, oh, go about my day, work a little harder on something, maybe develop a skill set. Um, he has basic awareness of other people. He doesn't go into a public restroom and throw his shit everywhere. Literal shit everywhere. <laughs> um, he helps and encourages others. Because he has some basic awareness of others, he says, hey, there's other people out there like me. I should encourage them to be good people too. Um, and isn't a raging hypocrite. He says what he does most of the time. Sure, he messes up, but hey, most of the time he's going to stick to what he says. Now, we go over to our other, our other character, Spooky Sandy. She reads no books. She reads horoscopes. She hates herself, so she hates other people. She's absolutely sure conspiracy theories are real based off what she read on online forums. And let me be clear here, conspiracy theories the government has committed some bullshit, and there is pockets of influence, but the real detriment to a society is profound illiteracy. The populace is responsible for the government, not the other way around. Um, and Spooky Sandy's prone to violent behavior. Just like on our last slide when we said every living organism has to, the first thing they do is that they have to not die. So when you don't read books and you don't have awareness of other people, Spooky Sandy's going to lash out violently. Maybe she'll join the police force. We'll find out here so shortly. <laughs> and our third character is Goofy Gary. Goofy Gary doesn't read anything. He doesn't even read a horoscope. Goofy Gary cheers obnoxiously, really loud at sports games. Goofy Gary is too insecure to realize he's insecure, so he dumps that on other people. He is so insecure, he talks about himself all the time and doesn't even realize he does it. <laughs> And finally, Goofy Gary thinks drinking is education. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take these three characters, we're going to put them in real life scenarios and see how they would act. And then we're going to look at the data of our own society and see how our society is. Let's have a look. So now we've set up our three characters and let's ask some scenarios and conjecture what we think these people would do in these scenarios. Um, Let's say each of the three people were teachers faced with questions they can't answer. Well, Spooky Sandy is really narcissistic. She hates herself, so she's got to hate her students. So she's going to not admit she doesn't know anything or doesn't know the answer and tell some personal story no one cares about. <laughs> What would Reasonable Randy do? Reasonable Randy would say, I don't know. <laughs> and then help their students and direct them to a resource or someone who would know. What would Goofy Gary do? Goofy Gary would make a one-liner joke no one asked about. Make a joke. Now let's say each of these three people are rich parents with the ability to buy college admissions. Well, Spooky Sandy, again, doesn't have awareness of any other people, and she just wants the best for her own kid. And again, there's a big scandal going on right now. 
where you, people just bought college admissions. So she would buy the college admissions. What would reasonable Randy do? Well, he would say, education is for whoever works for it. He would go to the library, read some books, and move on with his life. Read books. See? Again, we had his characteristics. Reasonable Randy would read a book. It makes so much sense. <laughs> now what would Goofy Gary do? Goofy Gary's too busy to blow he's too busy blowing the money on gambling and making more jokes to care about college. But he would actually Goofy Gary would think that because Gary well, Gary got a his degree. So he said, yeah, little Johnny, you should go to school, and then after four years, we can take $100,000 of debt for an Instagram picture. So Goofy Gary might buy, the, might buy the college admissions. He might do that. Now let's say each of these three people have to cancel plans with a friend. Well, Spooky Sandy, again, doesn't care about anybody else. She's just going to not show up. No alert, no text, no call, just not show up. Reasonable Randy would say, hey friend, I can't make it anymore at an appropriate time before not showing up and either reschedule or just cancel the plans. Tell friend. What would, now what would Goofy Gary do? Well, Goofy Gary would just, again, keep making some more jokes, and then, after that, he would just make a bunch of excuses. Make excuses. These, these really aren't real people. These are just convenient names. <laughs> but, um... Uh, Goofy Gary might also make the plans and then five seconds before the, 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 the rendezvous, he might, uh, might reschedule ad infinitum. Just keeps, just keeps, uh, rescheduling. But now, now, more seriously, what would these three people do if they're legislatures? Writing policy. Well, Spooky Sandy doesn't care. She just only cares about her job. She's one of those people that says, well, I was just, I was just doing my job. I'm, this is what I get paid to do. She's got to do, do, whatever, do whatever the constituents want. And then she's going to completely ignore the constituation and just vote on whatever thinks makes her political career better. So she's going to better her political career. What's Reasonable Randy going to do? He's going to read the policy and debate its merits. Again, here's Reasonable Randy reading again. Read and consider merits. And he can, he can validly assess the merits of the policy because he's read books and he has a solid scientific foundation behind it. He didn't just decide, hey, I want to have a better career, I'm going to run for something and run for some public office. Which, that's clearly what doesn't happen in our society. Um, now, what would Goofy Gary do? Goofy Gary would yeah, make more jokes. But he would definitely not read the statute. He would do whatever his friends are doing. Do whatever his committee wants him to do. Do what the party wants like a little sheep. Like a sheep. And so now, again, you probably think I'm joking, kind of joking, but not really. So now we're going to take literal, literal articles, and we're going to see which type of society and what type of characters we have in our society. Because imagine, these are just one individuals. Now imagine you have a, a million spooky Sandys. <laughs> Plus three million goofy Garys. <laughs> the society would be pretty fucked. And so let's have a look. 
So according to YouGov research, 25% of millennials say they have no friends. <laughs> and I think it's like the other generations are between like, I don't know, 10 and 30%, I believe. I think I think 25% is 30% is the highest, but it's like 10 to 25%. Um, and 74, according to Pew Research, I think this one came out. The YouGov, I think that was at the end of 2019. Both of these at the end of 2019. 75, 74% of Americans say they have read some book in the past 12 months. So conversely, 26% of Americans have read zero books. And on top of that, remember, we said literacy is actively reading and writing, not just the ability to, and frankly, reading some book, a liter literature book is a leisure activity, it's not education, um, it, it is, but you have to read technically first. Um, but again, one book, let me say something about reading. A lot of people might have like a long book list, I've read a lot of books, but the number of books does not matter. I mean, past, like I would say, past like 50, but you, you want to read for content. I mean, really sit down and think about what the people are writing, what they're saying, what it implies to other things. Because when I've been talking about these different ontologies and about generality going to specificity, when you learn from another person, that's the fastest way to learn. And when you learn, or when you read really diligently, that's how you learn the fastest. So this doesn't, this doesn't, you can go to school and have a doctorate degree. If you haven't sat down and really read books, it does not matter all of that much. You have to do real diligent reading. Um, and the point is, is illiteracy defaults to narratives that are not true. When you don't take the time to develop yourself, and the reason I have this stat up here, I mean, I went on the last slide, I went through a couple of different scenarios. That's just to give you some behavioral characteristics that really are very present in people that are really illiterate or people that haven't thought through things through for themselves. At least not thought about their own behavior. And now the loneliness stuff, and this is really still a problem of illiteracy. When you go to school for 18 years and you're taught to go from 45 minutes from this class to that class to that class to that class and take a bunch of tests, but you're not taught to connect with people and think about your emotions, you still haven't taken the time to educate yourself about your own self. And if you don't take the time to take about, if you don't take the time to learn about yourself, who's going to? Nobody. Um, and so when you don't read books, this is where narratives come from, right? This is where racism comes from. This is where wars come from. This is where selling shitty products comes from. I mean, people don't have the ability to discern specific language, correct language, and on the society level, I mean, it has real, real profound negative impacts, right? When we get, when we have the example of policymakers, when we look at our drug policy, I mean, it's a joke, honestly. I mean, people, human behavior. I mean, I'm going to do a lot of, lot more lectures, but it, there's no biological reason just to say drugs are bad. And then you look over 60, 70, 80 years of damage that is done, and it's an extremely common argument, but it's really true. And people still have not changed that behavior on a policy or societal scale, and it continues to do damage. Um, it doesn't matter, and again, this is the loneliness and the inability to uh, commit to friendship is just like the most basic thing ever. I mean, 25%, some people say, okay, well, 75% don't feel lonely. This number should be like 0% or close to 0%. I mean, all you need to not be lonely is just have someone kind of give a shit about your day. And the fact that this many people say they don't, it's again, people don't learn about themselves and then they turn into spooky Sandys and goofy Garys. They literally can't connect on a human level. That's what everyone's starving for. That's, I would say, the predominant social, econ not economic, but predominant social problem in our society. Um, but it really stems from people not reading books. Um, so I'm probably going to end this lecture here. Um, I thought this was some very good content. And we'll pick back up at another time.